Thank, thank you. Very happy to be here. And uh, I must say, if you were to do some sort of employee satisfaction survey, I'd probably have one of the more fun jobs you can have in Tesla, looking into the technology. So I'm glad to be able to be here today and share that with you. On my background, though, I am not a complete stranger to farming, even though I've not been a farmer. My grandparents were farmers back in Sweden, and my parents farmers, so sort of dairy and forestry. However, I was a uh, bit of hay fever, so I was gravitating more towards the forest. So I spent more time with the chainsaw than out uh, sort of among the dairy producing family members. Uh, uh, another thought that I just had when I was listening to our professor about cap and, and trade. Uh, one thing that we had cap and trade of is was uh, moose hunting. Because the farmers decided to drastically reduce the number of wolves we have in Sweden, which of course meant that the moose had no natural enemies except the occasional wolf or car that hits them. So then we had to do a cap and trade to reduce the amount of moose. They started by capping the time you were allowed to hunt, so one week. It was a very unsafe way of capping it because people are out shooting everything that moved, which also then reduced uh, the number of hunters and we had every, <laughs> even fewer natural enemies for the moose. So they, they changed it to uh, they changed it to capping number of moose. So our farm could count to hunt one and a half moose per year. Do you want how do you kill half a moose? Well, the small calves, they count as half a moose, so that was it. So I grew up on, on moose and potato uh, from, from that. It took our family about a year to eat up one and a half. Well, my parents were very resourceful also when it came to eat absolutely everything you can eat on moose. Maybe I didn't even agree that somewhere it was eatable, but my mother thought so. Then I, I went into, uh, of course, Sweden Nobel Prize engineers. I was very fascinated by all the, especially the physicists winning a Nobel Prize. I wanted to become an engineer. Went into engineering and joined Ericsson, so I spent my whole life 2G, 3G, 4G, and now rolling out 5G and Tesla. So I spent most of my time in Ericsson. Came here as CEO of Ericsson Australia for a few years, and then joined Tesla as CTO back into technology again. So what I wanted to talk to here is about not going through the whole pillar three, but uh, the things that I know something about, and that's supposed to be the three of two, the one in the middle, that the, the, the digitization of the of the world basically, not only of course about the the farming, but everything. So basically, there are few things that are happening right now, and that is the 5G, the big data, and the cloud. And if you combine it all, it's sort of underpins what we call Industry 4.0. And I'm going to talk about this Internet of Things, what that is really about. And uh, I'll first leave it to you to you see how can I associate what I'm doing, your, the farming business, into that. Try to give some examples. <coughs> so I will not go through vertical farming or tree technique or beef or anything, anything like that. So the IoT, if you think about it, that's an Internet of Things. And it's a big, big, probably that's the largest machine that man has ever made. It's global, it's all over. And it has a lot of things connected to it, a will have a lot of things. And those things, depending on who you ask, will be somewhere between 25 and 50 billion in just a few years. So we humans will be a minority on the networks, and all these things will be the majority of the network. And uh, with that, I would like to have a slide, the only slide I'm going to have, so don't worry. Uh, so this is going through what what is the, the Internet of Things? I'm trying to do it is an analogy to a big body, so that we have to relate to the big, all-encompassing global Internet of thing, thing. It has the data, which is basically the brain in the top, and now we have all the networks connecting everything from the compute and memory resources out to all the things out on the edge, which is basically the network, that's the nerves of this whole system, and then we have automation in the bottom. And there are basically only two kinds of things that can be connected to the Internet of Things. It's sensors and it's activators. Things that take in data and things that do stuff. That's basically the sensors in your fingertips or whatever, and it's the, the muscles that, that do things. And, and that is what the Internet of Things, you can look at it as this big, big body. So now comes a few challenges for us humans, and that's up to the left. How do we communicate with this thing? Uh, is it, how do we enter commands? Do we talk to it? Or how they, what can we see, what they see, so augmented reality, virtual reality, and voice control, this small simple example is uh, Hey Google, or Alexa, or Siri, or whatever you communicate, and then you get the response back. But actually, you are talking to this machine. 
Out to the right is the other sort of side effects about identity, cybersecurity, how is this safe? It's very cool that I can say that hot oven turn on till 100 degrees, but who is allowed to know that they have turned on the oven on till 100 degrees? Can everybody know that or only Siemens that actually is the manufacturer of that oven? So there are lots of things that should get more complicated. I mean, I think you, you have probably heard from one of you that there are more Australian meat sold in China than there is ever produced Australian meat in Australia. So there, there must be some, something to be done on the security and identity side also. And then we have up in, in, the, in the, the surface that I try to illustrate where different sort of technology trends right now, why they belong. The cloud and the big data that's up, up in the brain. And then 5G, that's part of the connectivity. I will come back to edge compute. And then out on the automation, we have <coughs> machine vision, the eyes, uh, IoT devices, all kinds of sensors. Probably the camera would be the most sort of generic uh, device out there. Drones, robots, vehicles, and everything that does things out there, more or less automatically. And then voice control, we talked about that. So, back then to what is one big difference between this body and our body? And that is the ability to distribute the compute. We can't really do that. Uh, uh, some, a few examples maybe. Some people say, well, I took that. That was a decision I took in my heart. So that was sort of a little bit of a distributed compute. Or we have a gut feeling. Uh, that's also. But the maybe most uh, scientific explained is the reflex you have when you when you touch something hot, there's a shortcut in your, that sort of distributed compute for, for you anyway. And, and that comes back also in these big networks. If you need short latency, you can distribute it out. But it would be very convenient once you learn a piece of piano, you can sort of distribute it out to your hands and your computers, in, in your brains in your hands. And you can even complete, complete, continue playing it even if you get a knock in the head because you have created a resilience. And that is one reason why we do it. So if I were to go through, some reasons why you would like to push out edge compute. One is, uh, and one thing that's usually talked about a lot is the latency. I think that is not so important. Latency is the time it takes for a signal to go back. It doesn't, I mean, of course, if you send a lot of signals back and forth, it takes, it takes about 17 milliseconds to go from Sydney to Perth. So it's not a big problem, really, the latency to start with, I would say. If you look at this screen over there, it's a the projector up there, it's 100 hertz, I'm sure. Frequency. So every screen you see here is 10 milliseconds between all of them. So 10 milliseconds in the camera also. So you 20 milliseconds before you see a picture and 17 milliseconds latency between as per and, and see. So that's not the thing. But re resilience, if you have data somewhere, you don't want it to disappear if something happens more central. Or you have lots of cameras, you don't want to pay for all the transmission going back there, then you want to process it more locally. Or in some cases, privacy. You, this data that is for about your, your farm, maybe you don't want everybody to see that. You don't want to put it up in the central brain. Even though the, uh, the human body has proven that centralizing power seems to be most effective. I will come back, back to that also in a little bit. Um, things you can do then, if you look at it from a farm example, of course, you can use drone to inspect things. That's good. Maybe you can have some remote uh, vehicles or even automated vehicles coming. I've seen examples of that. Uh, but the most important thing is all, all the sensors that you have out there, be it humidity, carbon dioxide, what kind of things are growing. And uh, also there we have cameras that can see what, what constitutes the, the crop that is grown, so you can have that very precise data. And, uh, and that leads us to the ability to get all this data and do something with it. And, and one very important concept there is uh, what we call the data exchange that we started working on. And that is, you're getting a lot of data, but then uh, you, uh, if you could combine that with some other data, it would be much more valuable. But maybe you don't want to give up your data. So now, how, how do I give away data in a way that can be combined and then it's sort of not, I haven't given it away. So that is an important part of the data exchange. Because many of you know, I, I, I got a puppy this weekend, so you know, if you see a wet spot somewhere, there. I don't know if it's wet, but you can at least see it's darker, so that's the ice, and then you can touch it, it's wet, and you can smell it, it's fine. So then you are combining three different kinds of data sources into an insight, 
it actually told me about something there. And you can do that in a more clever way if you combine what is the price for, for my product, or how much will it rain, how much will water cost, and whatever, and then you can generate, generate insights and you can share them. Um, and out of that comes uh, another concept that we could call the, the, the digital twin. When you get all this data and all this compute power, you can basically create a copy of real life in a digital twin. A, a, a trivial example could be as a, a demonstration for somebody that were in Vantage, our big show we had sort of a pump station. And you look at the pump station with just a sort of a 3D model of it. But you can actually see what is the speed of the pump, what's the temperature of the water going and everything. So it becomes just a very advanced dashboard. That's the first step. Secondly, now it becomes a remote control because you can want to maybe want to change that a little bit. Now it becomes a simulator also because you can see what happens if I do that. Oh, that was not good. Do that, do that on the real life. Only do it on the digital twin. And finally, it becomes a training tool for somebody you want to train around this. Say that you can do that with your tech, with your farm. I mean, one example is you can do it with traffic lights in the city and see what happens without actually doing it and see get a two-hour backlog of the traffic. But in the farm, if you could do this really, really well, you could basically simulate what can happen with this much fertilizer, this much watering, and this and this and this. And you can take a digital twin, fast forward, and go to the bank, as we discussed before, and say, this is what it will look like. If I get this money with my harvest, it will be this much. If I get this much, it will be that much. And you basically bring your future harvest to the bank and negotiate what your charge should be for, for the financing. It sounds a bit futuristic, but uh, it's, it's very close to be here. And coming back to something that takes, looks like it's going to take a long time, and then it goes very fast. In the technology space, we used to say it takes over 30 years for a technology to become an overnight success. Because once it happens, it just happens. That's probably down now from 30 years to maybe 10 years, but some, somewhere around there. And so what are we doing concretely now using our data exchange with all this data and or, or digital tools? We're working with a few different projects. One is around uh, the Murray Darling uh, Basin, that some of you, I'm sure, are involved in. One is around the Lower Birken River up in Queensland. It's both for the cane farming, but also for what's happening to the Great Barrier Reef and being able to control that. And also, we are working with uh, some of the industries in Kumumba. And as we discussed uh, earlier here, also, the, the only way to move forward on some of these things, be that financing, be that regulations, and whatever it is, is to have the facts what is actually happening. And these technologies have the chance to give us the facts and even model and simulate what will happen if you go to the digital twin, twin model. We are also working with another project the data exchange is about the connected supply chain. Both goods coming into Australia, the domestic distribution of goods in Australia and goods leaving the export and, and coming back to how to make sure that what, what I sent is actually what arrives quality control and all that. <laughs> so, um, that was an intro to what all this is about. We can discuss it now. I have one more comment and reflection on that also from the discussions this morning. I've been working with R&D uh, technologies through over, over 30 years. And my, my recipe that I've found that's worked really well Usually, and I, from the discussion this morning, it seems like to be a common theme also, and that is that I have my, my four C's. Number one is competence. You have to start with competence. Number two is uh, confidence. Uh, it's, not, it's very dangerous to people that are confident without competence. So you start with the competence, <laughs> then you go to the confidence, and then from that you move on to cooperation. And it's much easier to cooperate with people that have confidence, so that's why I find that it's very important in that step order. And once you have the cooperation going, you can start to communicate about all the good things that's going on. Uh, people that start to communicate without even have something going on is also dangerous. So that's sort of the, the four that I've always tried to drive in organizations I've been working with. Start with the competence, the confidence, the cooperation, and the communication. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.